Hello and welcome to People in Profit. I'm Charles Pellegrin, and in this edition, a big picture conversation about the system that governs the lives of a large chunk of humanity, capitalism, a system where trade and industry are in the hands of private owners seeking to make a profit. It's been credited with the meteoric rise in global wealth and development seen in the last few centuries. It's also seen as the root cause of the biggest challenge facing humanity today, global warming. Well, seen on radio, the Peabody-nominated podcast series produced by Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University has dedicated its latest season to exploring capitalism's history, its failures, and future all over the course of 13 episodes. John Bewin, co-host of the podcast, joins us now from North Carolina, where he's also a director of storytelling at the Keenan Institute. Uh, thank you for being with us. Good to be with you, Charles. Thank you. Well, first off, I, I want to start where you start your podcast with your first episode called Market Failure. Uh, the term is used to point out the instances in which the free market fails in its goal of providing goods and or services in the most efficient way possible. Why did you start there? Well, it's it, the title is also meant a, a little bit more broadly <laughs> to, to evoke the challenges that are being directed toward capitalism in our time. More broadly, I think, you know, there are there are worldwide surveys that show that large proportions of people, for example, there was one five years ago across 28 countries where 56% of the respondents said that capitalism does more harm than good in the world, or they agreed with that statement. And that's reflective of other surveys, particularly of young people who are questioning whether this system serves humanity and obviously other living things well in, in, in its current form. Uh, but yes, the, 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 the more specific ev evocation of market failure was about things like, well, in the U.S., where we don't have nearly as strong a system of subsidies for things like child care, uh, elder care, housing, right, uh, health care and uh, health insurance, where we rely heavily on the market to provide these things, and they simply don't do a very good job of it. A lot of people have health and child care, which is one example that we look at directly. It, it doesn't serve the industry. People who work in that industry can't, um, are, are living on the edge of poverty, the, uh, and the people who need that service to a large extent can't afford it or are greatly burdened by the charge. So, so, so if you leave something like that to the market, it seems it simply doesn't always work. The market doesn't work for everything. Well, after, after looking at those, those failures, but you all, where you also did in the episode, you also mentioned sort of the, 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 the benefits of, of this uh, system being in place. Um, you sort of look at the origin story here and what happened before capitalism. Um, it's quite helpful to look at, at that, uh, at, at before capitalism. The episode dedicated to feudalism, uh, specifically in, in Britain. What did that teach you about the nature of capitalism? Yeah, it, it, it really ends up from for me as a non, frankly, non economist, non historian, I'm a journalist. Uh, it, it really helped clarify for me what capitalism is, because I think a lot of us don't really have a really clear understanding. It's what it's the system where you buy and sell stuff and you exchange money. Well, no, the, that's been around much, much longer for two or 3000 years. People have been, uh, in fact, using money in some cultures and certainly trading for much longer than that. So what capitalism does, it, it, the, the, a really key understanding, it seems to me, is that capitalism is a system where those who are uh, extracting wealth from the labor and from the natural resources of the, of the society are, th are then turning it around and investing it to leverage the creation of more wealth. And that's what you really didn't have under feudalism. You did have an exceedingly um, exploitative system, right, where the people at the top, the nobility, were basically um, siphoning the wealth that was created by the peasant class, by the vast majority of people working on the land. But that money, what the rich people did with that money was essentially to build cathedrals, to build castles, to build armies, to buy nice things for themselves. 
they weren't obviously investing in creating corporations and so on that would that would leverage the creation of a lot more wealth. They weren't using capital in the way that we understand capital today as something that is invested to create more wealth. Um, so that's an important understanding, I think, as to why those things wouldn't happen until later. That that's that's where capitalism really gets going is when people are doing doing that. So, so we get to, to that point, and we will we'll jump forward to the 18th century to um, the capitalist ideal to a certain extent uh, that it, that exists out there, and it was fleshed out by by Adam Smith in the 18th century in his book, um, The Wealth of Nations. Uh, the theory shows us a system where the, the greater good is very. And I'm, I'm you know summarizing here, obviously, is achieved when when people are a- allowed to act in self interest. Um, what do you think Adam Smith would make of capitalism? Uh, if he was around today, well, it's it's obviously very dangerous to try to 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 you know speculate on what Adam Smith would would say uh, you know 250 years after his death almost, but um, but what we what we end up saying about Adam Smith is that he is he's often very much misused and abused in in being propped up as a kind of symbol and a po- poster boy for laissez-faire get government out of uh, out of the market kind of ideology when in fact that's not really representative of what he what he said and what he stood for he was a much more complex character clearly he 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 spoke with great kind of awe and admiration about the power of free enterprise of the market to to generate wealth to to create products that met met people's needs and so on but he was also very critical, not so much of the kinds of things that free marketeers criticize today, like government um, protection of workers. He was actually for that. He said he said that legislatures generally do the bidding of what he called the masters, the employers, the owners of capital. And so when from time to time they actually do something that prote- protects the interests of workers, it is always just and equitable, to quote him. <laughs> so it's a very different idea than what people often present today, the sort of Milton Friedman idea, which was that Smith said you should just, government should do nothing in the economy. He didn't say that. And actually his his invisible hand uh, metaphor is also misused and mischaracterized. He was talking about a specific kind of uh, example in which a business person or investor decides to build a business close to home rather than abroad. He said that helps the community, even though that person, the local community, even though that person may not have been thinking about that, he was just thinking about his own interest. So sometimes when you take an act, act in your own interest, it helps other people. That's not the same as the way that that uh, image is often used today as some kind of ironclad law of nature in which anything you do in your self-interest economically is good for the society. He simply was not saying that. I want to pick up on something you said here because it relates to, to another uh, area you cover in the in the in the podcast. Um, you mentioned Milton Friedman and this idea of laissez-faire capitalism. Um, the ties, uh, this this the glory years uh, uh, of of capitalism can be you know traced to, to can can be pinpointed to the second half of the 20th century in the U.S. and that's also when U.S. businesses start really organizing. Uh, to pressure the government to lobby for less government intervention, more freedom. And in, in your podcast, you mentioned one particular uh, confidential memo from 1971, which really underlines uh, that change in the trajectory of, of economic history. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, the Powell memo, it's called. It was written by Lewis Powell, who would, shortly after he wrote this memo, he would be appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court by Richard Nixon. He was uh, he was a corporate lawyer. And he was asked by the US United States Cham- Chamber of Commerce, the national kind of business advocacy group, to write a memo. It was not for public consumption. It was it was an internal memo to basically exhort the US Chamber of Commerce and business uh, the business community more generally to co- to mount a campaign uh basically in defense of free enterprise and to put that in context this was 
1971. It's after several decades after um, the, the Great Depression and the New Deal and then the post-war period in which you had a really pretty strong consensus from the right to the left to the right in, in the mainstream, at least, and I'm talking about the United States in particular, where you had um, basically a kind of mixed economy, a kind of social democratic consensus in which, yes, we are absolutely, we want capitalism, we want free enterprise, but government plays a very substantial role. We want strong unions, we support uh, union organizing and uh, the, uh, uh, a kind of increasingly strong safety net. And this was frustrating to uh, some in the business community and they basically mounted a campaign over, over that started at that time. Now, it's not so much a conspiracy theory like, oh, this memo, you know, launched something specific because actually some of the more powerful um, action in this regard in terms of this campaign was not by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. It was the Koch brothers who put billions and billions of dollars into creation of think tanks and advocacy groups and advancing a, a kind of ideological campaign, public relations campaign to discredit government, to say government is messing in our lives and, and is doing more harm than good and we need to get less and less government and in favor of free enterprise. And, and there were also, you know, there were certainly circumstances at that time that helped this cause, namely dramatic inflation in the 1970s in the United States and other failings of the uh, of, of general perception that there was too much regulation of industries like airlines and so on. And even the Democratic Party helped to dismantle some of that. So there was this, there was a very strong swinging of the pendulum in favor of what we now call neoliberalism. Um, the ties between capitalism and, and the current climate catastrophe were already also outlined in a report from around the same era as that Powell memo in 1972, the, the report called The Limits of Growth, uh, commissioned by the Club of Rome. Why weren't the warnings heeded, the warnings that were in that, in that report? Well, it's such a great question. Um, Yes, and this was a report by a group of scientists at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where they did very careful uh, modeling at that time, computer modeling of the various crises that humanity faces. And they basically said, if we stay on the same course with, with ever increasing production, consumption, extraction, uh, and spewing of things into the, into the environment, that by the middle of the 21st century, we're going to we're going to be in real danger of the collapse of our industrial civilization. This was not heated. I would say basically, I mean, people may have been sincere in in simply not believing that this could happen, but there was a there was a widespread um, just refusal to take this seriously, and they were actually ridiculed and shouted down by many people, by economists first and foremost but also by political figures and business leaders. And it simply kind of disappeared, uh, the report, even though it got a burst of attention initially. Um, but yes, we essentially, we did can stay on the course that they were warning about and, and we're in trouble today as a result. John Bewin, uh, this is unfortunately all the time we have uh, together, but thank you so much uh, for, your, for your insights and for telling us about your uh, podcast. You're the co-host of Seen on Radio, uh, the podcast series, and this latest series is, about, is called Capitalism. Um, that's all we have time for, unfortunately. If you'd like to watch some of our previous editions of the show, you can check out our website or app or even the podcast platform of your choice by searching for People and Profit. In the meantime, thank you for watching and stay tuned.